Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy Wheat, for being such a fabulous collaborator and bringing this uh, to Facebook, and Matt Turpin for being instrumental in allowing us to crash this beautiful dining hall. It could not be a more appropriate place for me to offer this talk. So I'm here to talk to you about survival. And I'm a letterpress printer, so this topic is very near and dear to my heart. And I'm not gonna assume that everyone in this room even knows what letterpress printing is anymore. So I'm just gonna briefly say, what I do is I print with equipment that is 50, sometimes over 100 years old. It's the type of machinery that has narrowly survived the evolution of print technology. The story I wanna tell you about today is about surviving change. Now this photo is very striking. You are looking at the demolition of the South Lake, uh, I'm sorry, of the Seattle Times building in South Lake Union, just a few blocks away from here. Now, if you look very closely, as this building has been disemboweled, look into its entrails, and what do you see? Printing presses. If you ask the Seattle Times, what happened? They would say, technology. Technology happened. And technology is happening all around us. New technology is disrupting and replacing what came before it, just like it always has. Seattle's making the headlines all the time now. You've seen these articles. We have the largest population growth. We have the most cranes. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not the first time that change has happened to this particular part of the city. This is what the South Lake Union neighborhood looked like the last time Seattle's population spiked quite this much. This was the Denny Regrade. Have you heard of the Denny Regrade? Well, back in the early 1900s, Seattle's topography was literally transformed. This is a before shot. And if you look way in the distance of this photo, you'll recognize Queen Anne Hill. But have you ever seen the hill in front of it? No, that was Denny Hill. Here's an after shot. Why would Seattle remove an entire hill? It was driven by commerce. That hill was a physical barrier preventing the expansion of the commercial district. Well, once again, Seattle's easing the way for more commerce, but instead of digging down, they're building up. Let's walk down this very street, just a few blocks, and we're encountering the School of Visual Concepts old building. It was built in 1920. It's one of the last remaining vestiges of the Denny Regrade era. This is your typical view of it because it has been surrounded by construction for the last several years. It deserves tearing down, but it's one of the only ones left still standing. Does anyone have fond memories of this old space? Yeah, <laughs> of the inadequate air conditioning, maybe getting stuck in the elevator, or maybe you were trapped down in the basement trying to go to the restroom. <laughs> so we could either fight the situation we were in, or we could own it. And I think these posters show that SVC was pretty good at owning it. Like the Seattle Times, we were um, also a company that was struggling in this new time. After all, the future, supposedly, of education was online learning. And I won't lie, it felt like we were fighting to survive in this new business climate. So ironically, my story today starts with a case of metal type. Back in 2001, Juliet Shen, she's a typographer and she taught type classes at SVC for over 20 years, she learned that that case of type was going to be thrown away. She wanted to save it. She thought it would make a great teaching tool for her classes. So she asked Linda and Larry, SVC's co-directors, who of course said, woohoo, let's save it. And why not get a press too? Because that's just how they roll. <laughs> and when I heard that they had acquired a printing press, I immediately showed up on their doorstep and I acquired much more equipment, and I began teaching letterpress classes. 
at, let's not forget, a school of profession for professional development. <laughs> this is one of many, many professional development classes that get offered <laughs> at SBC. Also, this was in 2001. <laughs> so, <laughs> was it ironic or was it actually perfect that we started the first publicly accessible print shop when everyone else was starting to abandon print for pixels? You may be asking yourself, why would SVC start a print shop then? But what you really should be asking yourself is, why did they put it on the second floor? <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> let's just think for a moment about that literal and symbolic balance of putting tons of cast iron and lead on the other end of a building from a computer lab. And SVC instinctive be instinctively believed that that balance would provide a stronger program. We also saw it as a decent investment because our presses still work just as well as the day they were made. How well will your MacBook Pro work in 110 years <laughs> or even 10 years? We started the letterpress program at the same time the neighborhood began its tech-fueled growth spurt. This is what our neighborhood looked like when I started teaching classes, and this is what it looks like today. Paul Allen's Vulcan Real Estate is responsible for this large-scale redevelopment of this neighborhood, and several major tech companies are based in Vulcan-developed properties. It's invested more than $6 billion in this neighborhood since 2002. So our neighborhood that we had been in for over 40 years was rapidly changing, and we were encountering new signs of change every day. <laughs> the business climate was changing as well. If your starting salary is $90,000 and you get a $20,000 signing bonus, and all-you-can-eat bananas, <laughs> you don't tend to think you need a lot of vocational training at that point. Was SVC doomed because it had this old-style teaching method in an obsolete building in a new world that valued online learning, computers, and modern efficiency? No, we weren't doomed. We're not only surviving, we're thriving, and not in spite of the technology companies that surround us, but because of them and with them. Here's our survival kit. It contains three ways that we stayed relevant. One, we got people connected and invested in what we were doing. Two, we became a haven for hands-on craft when it was most needed. And three, we used our craft to give back to the community in meaningful and inspiring ways. First, I want to talk to you about community outreach. And by community outreach, what I really mean is hustle. I have been hustling so hard for years trying to make a place for letterpress printing in Seattle. But what I finally realized is I was actually in the right place at the right time. One of the ways I hustled was by putting on annual events, like the Waze Goose. I did not come up with this term. Waze Goose <laughs> is a term from the Renaissance, and it essentially means a printer's party. For us, it was a way to bring the public into our space. And we wanted to show people that letterpress printing was happening all around us. So we would invite all the local letterpress printers to sell their wares and swap equipment. <laughs> and we invited people into our letterpress shop and they produced keepsakes. Now, this keepsake by Carl Montford reads, celebrating 10 years of remaining 100 years behind the times. <laughs> and this one by Annabelle Larner says, unplug thyself. Depart from your screens. Try communicating with the letterpress machine. Then we added steamroller printing. Now we are not, <laughs> we're not the first, we're certainly not the last 
place to try printing giant posters so big that you need to get some construction equipment instead of a printing press to print them. But ours is different from all of these other events because being a design school, we involve the design community. We invite them to form design teams. They compete to print the coolest poster in what we're calling the Steamroller Smackdown. We've been doing it for many years now. What I find so interesting about this event is that digital designers will voluntarily take the time to hand carve a three foot by four foot piece of linoleum and run it over with construction equipment. <laughs> this is our old building at the end of the day when we had a steamroller smack down there. The first year we did this, it really felt like a three ring circus. It was a complete spectacle. More than going up to the print shop, this was the interactive part of the event that really appealed to people. Now we're in the position that we need to turn teams away. Why is this? I think, <laughs> I think it's because it's an easy way for creatives to interact meaningfully in their community and in the larger community and get their hands dirty in the process. We've begun partnering with different organizations each year and creating design themes. The first year we did this, we matched every single design team with a different local museum. So on the left, you can see the Museum of Flight was so thrilled to be involved, they sent their mascot. And on the right, uh, Starbucks Creative, you can guess who they were matched with, Mopop. Um, by the way, Starbucks Creative comes with um, costumes that are just incredible. And I would love to just do a many faces of Victor Melendez show for you guys, but that would be, <laughs> that would be favoritism, so I won't do that. Some of these relationships that were formed have started a dialogue about the evolution of Seattle. One year we partnered with Mohai, the Museum of History and Industry, and they came up with a theme of man versus machine. The winning poster that year by DEI Creative shows a human heart with the words fulfillment center in the middle of it. It's really clever, right? The thing that we did to help our letterpress shops survive and remain relevant and get the community involved ended up turning into a social forum. Then one day, the construction got so bad surrounding SBC, we could not offer this event in its normal location. And we were literally roadblocked. Meanwhile, Vulcan Real Estate, the largest South Lake Union landlord, had an annual tradition of their own, the South Lake Union Block Party. We've always participated in the block party with a small printing booth. People can come and print their own posters. We call it the plein air printing parlor. And Vulcan always saw it as a vital part of their event because we brought it that hands-on art presence. So that year when Vulcan reached out to see if we wanted to have a booth again, I had to make a very bold ask. And I said, would you be willing to host our SmackDown? And of course, they said yes. Um, they were really thrilled to do so, and they've been incredibly generous hosts. So whereas before, I used to have to rent a roller, it had gotten so hard to do this because of all the construction going on. They were all taken. <laughs> so Vulcan, they just call up their contractor and a construction worker from like the next construction site over just drives it over that morning <laughs> and and then we dress him up so <laughs> I think it's so appropriate that Vulcan which is responsible for all this growth in Seattle is helping us put on an event where digital designers are making art with construction equipment it's so perfect Another thing that improved our connection with the community in a major way was moving SVC a few blocks south just a couple of years ago. We finally gave up on that old building. 
but we didn't give up on our neighborhood. This time, we put the letterpress shop front and center, and we painted its walls bright red, and it is literally the heart of SBC. Now we're really in the thick of it. We are smack in the middle of our techie neighbors, but it has been a really good move for us. To cater to these neighbors with notoriously busy schedules, we began offering two hour letterpress workshops called letterpress at lunch and team building events. So we've hosted multiple events for Amazon and most of the other major tech companies in Seattle. Incidentally, this is what one Google employee chose to set. <laughs> so what made, <laughs> what made letterpress at lunch and the team building events so appealing to our techie neighbors was the lack of technology. Which brings me to craft. We recognized that in a world dominated by tech, there was a yearning to do things by hand. This is not a new idea. This is a tech company from the Industrial Revolution. You're looking at the Marconi Radio Company, and they invented wireless communications during the late 19th century. Check it out. They've got an open concept office, <laughs> standing desks. <laughs> You'd think we've come a long way, right? But maybe we haven't. <laughs> so we're in the midst of another industrial revolution, the digital revolution, and this is today's factory. And you all recognize this space? This is Facebook headquarters in Menlo Park. Of course, Facebook also has an incredible analog laboratory. It's a venue for visiting artists, and it's a makerspace for its employees. There's actually a mini one called the Analog Outpost right here in this building. This is not just an employee retention perk. The artwork that comes out of the analog lab is an integral part of Facebook's culture. And you see the posters actually in this room right now. Well, in the late 19th century, the mechanization of labor spawned an analog work movement as well. And that was called the arts and crafts movement. Its main proponent, William Morris, was the original hipster. <laughs> Check out that beard. He was, among other things, a printer. As a reaction to the societal changes brought about by the Industrial Revolution, William Morris purposely chose to use pre-industrial methods in his work. He chose to work with iron hand presses, which were becoming archaic even in his time. Those are the slowest kind of presses to use, where absolutely everything is done by hand. He also designed his own typefaces, and he made his own paper. He created these books completely by hand. Well, designers of the digital revolution are feeling a similar pull to the analog. What you're seeing here is a magical moment. And this is something that I get to see on a regular basis at SVC. You're looking at a designer pulling her very first letterpress proof. And can you see how wrapped up in this physical object that she's just made. Um, for her, this is probably the first thing that she's made that's super tangible. And, and it's probably very different from the ephemeral things that she's used to making on the computer. The work that you saw a few slides ago from those team building events is what we can do in just a couple hours. But this is the type of work that students do in 10 weeks. When people sign up for Intro to Letterpress, I force them not to use the computer. They have to embrace tangible design techniques. But we have a comprehensive curriculum that, in, that um, continues into advanced letterpress printing. And then they can use the computer. And they can work with photopolymer plates. And we offer master class workshops. So you'd have to be a letterpress printer to realize that type on a curve is not so easily achieved in a letterpress shop. So that's why they're all amazed. 
So we're striving for the highest expression of craft, both concerning handset type and the marriage of analog and digital design. So if you don't recognize this guy, this is Brad Vetter. He came and taught a workshop at SVC from Kentucky. And he's made a name for himself designing on the computer and then generating laser cut letterpress plates. So we're breathing new life into this old craft and we're ensuring its survival. But our most important survival strategy is this. We use our craft to fulfill a need in the community. The working relationship we have with Seattle Arts and Lectures is the best example of this. I want to explain how it's become the cornerstone of our program. It just doesn't get any more meaningful than this. These are two kiddos at Seattle Children's Hospital. They are participants in the Children's Hospital Outpost of Writers in the Schools, which is put on by Seattle Arts and Lectures. Teen Maga here and Hunter, who was then a kindergartner, had become friends uh, during their treatments and they're writing poetry together. So Seattle Arts and Lectures, they put poets in residence or writers in residence in Children's Hospital and these kids who are sometimes in palliative care or maybe they're just there very, very long term, they're able to create beautiful poetry. Well, Sierra Nelson, one of the writers in residence, approached SVC wanting to put these poems in letterpress broadside form. So of course we said yes. And we have been doing this for seven years now. We just wrapped up the seventh portfolio of these. Now these beautiful broadsides help build a lasting legacy for a dying child. Some of them are joyful and light. So the one on the left with the giraffe reads, giraffe, I want to ride you so we're flying in space. And it's just so funny. And some of them are incredibly dark and they will just rip your heart out of your chest, like the one on the right, and it's about being on the edge of death. So the kids and their families, writers in the schools, Children's Hospital, SVC, all of these people who have come together to make this project happen, we have so much pride in creating a physical manifestation of a child's spirit. Here's how we do it. Once a year, we get all of our expert printers together and we fight over the poems. <laughs> and every time we get together, it feels just like a family reunion. When we're finished, we get together again. We collate these, portfolio, these broadsides into a portfolio that goes to the children's families and Seattle Arts and Lectures and Children's Hospital. And they use these for fundraising purposes. Our current round of Children's Hospital Broadsides is on a permanent tour of the city. It goes to all the Seattle Public Libraries and it's going to be at Seattle Art Museum for the third time this summer. So you can see, we have come up with ways of using our old style techniques as an avenue for doing good in the community. Our message isn't just come learn this cool old technique, but rather Come learn this cool old technique that will satisfy your desire to do something that will make a difference. I have one more example, and it's when we opened up our letterpress studio for the Women's March. So you've heard the saying, the power of the press belongs to those who own one. Well, by sharing ours that day, we were able to spread that power around. We printed 500 posters that day. Not only was the process of hand printing a protest poster cathartic, but it enabled people to use their voice and distill their message into its essential core and actually be heard. In these turbulent times of change, we sometimes feel like we are the little, press, the little print shop that could. And we're not anti-technology. We embrace technology.
but we also embrace the idea that hands-on craft can fulfill creative, spiritual, and artistic needs that technology can't. So that brings me to the end of my story, but I have an epilogue. Last summer, we participated once again at the South Lake Union Block Party, and it had a record attendance of 13,000 people. It was our most ambitious steamroller smackdown ever. We had 20 design teams, and we partnered with Seattle Arts and Lectures, and they came up with a theme of Northwest Stories. Remember my story of the Denny Regrade? Well, back then, if you were late in your payments to get your lot graded, the engineers would just grade right around it and leave your house stranded, sometimes 100 feet in the air. And these were called spite mounds. The winning poster last summer by Paper Hammer is about the history of redevelopment in South Lake Union. Here it shows the remaking of this neighborhood 100 years ago. And here, it shows the remaking of this neighborhood today. This is the Northwest story. And it's also our survival story. And the moral of the story is this. You can't stop progress. But don't just fall into line. Sometimes doubling down on the thing that makes you unique can be your best survival tactic. For us, letterpress printing, which seemed so out of touch with the times, was exactly what the times needed. And some say we're losing the old Seattle, but Seattle has always been shaped by change. Whenever old ways are disrupted and replaced, society will look for ways to meet its human needs of connection hands-on craft, and meaningful contribution. And that is always worth saving. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> we got a few little... I need to get away first? Sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to do Q and A in just a minute, but we're going to do a giveaway first. We have this keeping in the world of tight. We've got this great book from House Industries. They sent us today. It's out, I think, this week. Uh -huh. So we're doing a little raffle. Wait, I didn't go very deep. You didn't go, yeah. <laughs> I shook it up quite a bit. Okay. All right. Marcy, Marcy M. Not here. All right. Well, really? You left? Already? Ashley H. Ashley Hoffman. Yeah. yeah. There you go. All right. If you guys aren't familiar, this is the mic ball. You got a question? Raise your hand. We're going to throw it to the first person, and then you throw it to the next. Oh. Yeah. You just get to answer stuff. I get to throw it. So okay. who's, who's got a question? Oh, way in the back. Colin. All right. Colin, I'm going to walk around. <laughs> There's the equipment between you and me that I can't afford. Here we go. Colin. Hey. Um, I just want to say thanks for all your hard work all the time with the letterpress and the printing. Um, it's totally fun and worthwhile. And I just wanted to shout out the Vera Project print studio as well. Um, you should check that out if mm -hmm. you're into it. That's all. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Next question. I'm just curious what your next public event is at the Letterpress studio. Oh, thank you for asking. So let's see, we, have, we like to do lots of annual events. And the next one will be the Steamroller Smackdown again on August 11th. Um, this time, we're partnering with KEXP. And the theme will be Where the Music Matters. So 
again, a geographic theme. Are you ready? Here we go. Uh, this is just curiosity, but if you weren't doing letterpress, I was curious what other pre-internet, pre all these digital tools types of hobby would you do? Oh, that's easy. I, I think I would be a landscape designer. Or I was thinking about this actually, like what, what could I do that would not go out of style? And I think like working land and dirt and stuff, that's not gonna go away, so. Anybody else? All right, we got some up front. Ready? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Hi, um, I just want to say thank you for the um, Women's March printing day. That was really, really important to me and my family. My sister and I were both there. And I have a question. Um, has SBC published like a catalog of the of the many beautiful letterpress portfolios you've created? Has has SBC published a book about that yet? Uh, about Children's Hospital? About Children's Hospital or, I mean, yeah. I mean, almost like best of the last several years. I think that is such a great idea. And I've been thinking about that in the back of my mind. We have not done it, but we definitely need to. Something yeah. physical that yeah. it can get out there. Yeah. What's yeah. your relationship to Hatch? Oh, well. Just buds? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I have work at Hatch right now in their show. They, they just did a premiere of the Letterpress film, which we're going to work to bring to Seattle in September in conjunction with our Waze Goose. Um, and at that show, they invited Letterpress printers from all over the country to just show what they've been up to. So that's my main connection with Hatch right now. I've actually never been there. Yeah. Hatch show print. Did you just ask that question? Hat show print um, print show posters, and they're in Nashville, and they're right now they're at the Country Music Hall of Fame. Run by the Mr. Sweet Jim. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. That was great. Uh, I want to know when cl when do classes start? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So the next round of classes start the last week of June, and all of the newest classes are up on SVC's website right now. Sign me up. OK. It's <laughs> the point of the ball, right? Yeah. Throw it around. Yeah. OK. Um, I had a question. So regard, I feel like there's a million opportunities to use letterpress. And one thing that really strikes me with your talk is how you found very finite moments to not only brand yourselves, but offer a diverse uh, offering. I don't know. Yeah. So how did you, as a team, come up with such a finite uh, itinerary or schedule of things when you could do a million different opportunities. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, right. Like you so, have two signature events and you have the classes and it seems like it's very well layered. I'm just curious mm -hmm. how that developed. Well, all of those events, except for the Women's March poster printing, um, are things that we've done many, many times and they're a tradition and we've built them into our schedule and they require months of planning. Um, Whenever we think about new collaborations, we try to think about how is this going to benefit people and how will it benefit the letterpress shop? And that's how we make that decision, whether we actually have the manpower and the energy to, to pull it off. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>